Welcome on my virtual hike today. So we're just outside St. Helena and Britannia Bay. So here we have big boulders, rocky outcrops that erupts from the beaches up in elevated spaces. Now here in between the cracks and crannies of the rocks, there are very special plants that grow. The flowers might not be as bright as these daisies that you see right next to the highways, but they're just as special and even more unique because they only occur here. Now these rocks create microclimates and the plants that grow here in most cases are only adapted to grow here and nowhere else. So I'm going to take you in between under the bushes, between the rocks, and we're going to look at some of the interesting plants that's actually flowering now. So this is in between two days, only a snapshot of what's in flower now. And every month when you come, even in summer times, there are different plants in flower. So the diversity on these rocks are quite astounding. What makes that so beautiful is that this creates a microclimate. So the mist comes up from the sea and it hangs here and that gives even more moisture to the plants. The rocks that we have here erode and that gives nutrients to the bulbs and um, geophytes and succulents and annuals that grow here. And we have animals, dassies, in abundance and their excretions and mist that they give, that gives extra nutrition to the flower sets flowering here. So let me take you on a journey and let's enjoy the flowers. They are gorgeous. So a plant I see, I've spotted here, which is a plant that I've been looking for. And it's not a rare plant it's all over the west coast, but it's not so easy to spot though. And it's part of the iris family. This is Ferraria crispo, the spinnacle blom. I even call it the ink pot flower because it's this dark color, looks like ink inside. This is part of the iris family and it's got the most beautiful scent I have in flowers. Mm. It smells like a freshly fermented vanilla pod. Some people say it stinks a little bit. I don't quite agree with that. They can see the structure of an iris, beautiful leaves, structural architectural leaves, and it's snug in between the rocks. Why? It wants to grow in the sand, but it can't because the porcupines would munch on it. They love Ferrarias. So it's quite protected in between the rocks. This is quite an old one. The flowers are sequential flowering, meaning that this beautiful and very impressive flower stalk that you have here shoots lots of flowers, but they only last for a day. And then they die down and the one at the bottom of this one, oh, that will flower now. And so it continues and continues. So you have a lot of flowers over a long time. But as I said, they only last for a little bit. Now crispa meaning curly and crispy. It's all curled up on the side of the petals there. But isn't the patterns beautiful? It's almost like leopard skin. This yellow and black and ah, oh, it's just incredible. Not a, not a color that you see a lot in flowers but very nice to see up here in the copies. One of the very interesting shrubs that grow here is this. This is called a touch me not or Melianthus elongatus. Now Melianthus, meli meaning honey and anthus meaning flower. So honey flower and it's true to its name because it literally drips with nectar and honey. And this is the plant you want in your garden when you want to attract sugar birds. Now in garden centers in, in town, we can easily buy Melianthus major, which is a big one. It's got huge gray leaves and much bigger red burgundy flowers. This is the smaller brother. And to be honest, this is a very cute one because it's not that big. It's kind of containable in your garden. Now look at the flowers, bright red. This is the flower. And then it's almost finished flowering. These are still bracts, almost reminds you of a poinsettia with some bracts at the point of the flower stalk, giving you that beautiful Christmassy color. Now, not only the flowers are really pretty, but look at the seed too. It looks like little lanterns, very, very pretty. The scent of the leaves is one of its big characteristics. And if you touch it, well, it's called a touch me not. It's got that very, I don't really like the scent, it's very, of putting but it's a way of also deterring um, animals and herbivores from the bush 
So a very nice shrub to have, easy to grow for your garden. So definitely have some in your garden to attract those sunbirds and wildlife. So not all flowers are getting action during the daytime. Some flowers want pollinators at night. And this is one of them. This is Silene undulata, the Villeta Bachblom. And here it is. It's all sticky on the back sides. I don't really know why. So if any of you do, please let me know. So apparently the uh, doesn't smell very nice the leaves. But yes, it gets pollinated by moths. So it's, it's daytime now, so it's gonna start to close and wait for evening again. So during summer, this area where we are now is extremely hot and dry. So plants need to survive through that period. Now plants have different methods in doing that. Our annuals do that through seed. So the seed lies in the ground and wait for the winter rainfall. And that's how they survive. Geophytes, bulbs, store all the energy underground, hide, hibernate, and then come when the rain comes again. And then you have the succulents. And the succulents here, we have quite a lot. And they survive by storing all the water and juices in their stems. Now we have a very interesting one here. This is Quaqua incunata. Isn't that just beautiful? It's in flower. And the scent of the flower, to me, it smells a bit like sweat, old sweat or old socks. So not very pleasant, but it's a very interesting, like ancient looking plant. And you can see how this would store all its energy in its stems. And it also photosynthesized through its stems. Now, there are not just only these succulents here. Right next to me is Senechia radicans. Now, we all know this as you know, a string of beads. And it's very popular overseas as a pot plant or a hanging basket plant that grows here. And also called in Afrikaans, Bobiyan Boiki. And then we have Euphorbias over here. They're starting to flower now. And Euphorbias is also a very famous genus where we have lots as garden plants. Now, all of these succulents store their energy. They're sucking it all up now and store it throughout the dry summer months. So we're all out flower hunting now, right? And probably the most prolific flower that we see, and it's in everybody's photo, is the Damophytica pluvialis, which is this daisy. It's called the rain daisy, okay? So they shoot up and they, they are kind of first in flower when the season is. But there's an interesting fact about them, a survival secret for this daisy, and that is its seed. Now, the rainy seasons here are different. Okay, sometimes you get lots of rain, sometimes you don't get any at all. So how does this flower survive? Because say there's a quick flush of rain and then it stops. All the seedlings came up, but now they die because there's no more rain and that does happen. They've got a solution to that and a secret. So if you look at the seed, they make two sets of seed. One is a disc and the other one is a stick. Now, the disc flies away in the wind. They are the stronger plants and they will germinate when the first rains fall. The stick seeds, they are heavier. They've got an inhibitor as well and they fall right where the plant is. So we have a rainfall, slight rainfall, the disc start to germinate. But if we don't have that rain and it only comes later and the first seedlings died, and we get heavy rain a year, a season later, or even a few months later, then the stick seeds will germinate. And I'll show to you here. I've got it open. So if we open it up, you will see there's a disc seed, which we buy in our seed packets, but on the side of the florals, of the seed heads, there's these stick seeds. And they are the ones, the backup plan for these Cape Daisies. On plants very clear. 
So the most important part for plants to thrive is its soil, right? So let's have a look at the soil that we have here. And if I dig out a little piece, look at it. See how dark it is. And it's got a sweet scent. Lots of decomposed organic material. It's not too clay. It's not too sandy. It's nice loamy soil that keeps the right amount of moisture as well. Well drained. And that's the secret. So how did this rich soil end up here it's because of all the millions and thousands of years of eroding of all the rocks behind me so they start to break in little pieces even smaller pieces smaller pieces and into little dust particles also the surrounding area the wind that we have here blow dust onto these rocks it rains or the mist and it flows down the water and gets caught in between roots and branches and rocks and stays there and so they build up also as i mentioned there's lots of animals here especially dussies and their droppings also flow down from the rocks and get caught here and over millions of years this turned out to be a beautiful rich soil and this soil is the secret why we can have this abundance of plants here and the variety is just astounding even here where i'm sitting now is another plant which is Wakendorfia paniculatum it's a Roy Canol, one of the very beautiful bulbs over here not too rare but isn't that just a stunner so as i mentioned before some of the flowers are hidden away and they're not as bright so you have to bend down and you really have to look in between the cracks and underneath the shrubbery or look for tiny little bulbs that come out. And I found one of those and this is a very nice one. This is called Vimbaya spicata or it's a swart spinnacle blom. And they're just in flower. I see there's some more coming out now. But isn't this coloring just so unique from black to cream to yellow? And it's quite a lot of flowers for such a small plant, iris looking leaves, and it's got a scent, kind of a spicy scent, not very sweet, but this is just special to see. So on these rocky slopes, real estate is quite rare, and any exposed bit of crack of soil is quickly occupied and here we can see and this is quite a special plant this is called trachyandra clamidufella it's called rhinosterkoel we have a similar species close to cape town which is called feltkoel which i cook and you can eat this one apparently smells very sweet so i'm gonna get closer ah it does very very nice so this plant although it doesn't look it almost looks like grass aloes it doesn't look old but i think this plant's very old because you can see the bulb is already exposed out of the cracks. There's not a lot of soil for it to grow, so the bulb is coming out already. Luckily, the porcupines haven't been able to get hold of this one. Very, very nice. So here's an example. If you think I was kidding about porcupines, being hungry here you can see how they dug out one of the bulbs that was here but i mean we can't blame them now huh? we all have to eat and that's kind of the cycle of life but the bulbs are still feeding the wildlife too so this is called octopus echinatus or cicatrus bear's claw bear's claw because it kind of looks like a bear's claw if you've seen one Cicatrus because the roots in the olden days were used as a concoction to treat all kinds of ailments. They are family of the parsley or carrots. And these come in male or female. And around me is all females. So this is girls only. And you can see all the seed heads developing now, all the seed. It's very, very thorny, so you don't want to step on that barefoot. They are deciduous in summer, so they go away, and then they come back into these beautiful displays of flat alien-looking plants. Tristan, there's another orchid here. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about this one? Because I don't know much about this orchid here. This is Corisium orobanchioides. So this is, a lot of the Corisiums have tight um, little flowers that are almost closed and there's a tiny opening. Very small. And that's for a beetle. And the beetle is not looking for nectar, it's looking for oil. The flower has oil secreting glands inside oh, okay. and the beetle collects the oil and feeds it to its larvae. And that's how this orchid gets pollinated. Okay. It, it, has, it has a smell, so you can have a smell and tell oh, me what you think. Okay. <laughs> to me, it's, it smells like a bit of a stick, uh, you know, the stink insects, stinky ones. It smells like yeah, that. It's it, not very nice. It shouldn't be pleasant. No, not at all. Isn't it called like a monk's hood orchid? Yeah, a monk's hood orchid because of that closed, almost fused um, petals and sepals. Yeah that create this hooded space for the beetle to collect its oil. Very interesting. There's something we don't think about. We always think of only nectar and pollen that the a flower provides the insects, but oil is also part of that. That's very interesting. Yeah. It's one that you don't see <laughs> clearly. Very, very nice. Thank you for that. Gladiolus a lot or the Kalkwinki. Lots of ants. Now why is it called the Kalkwinki? Uh, it's called the little turkeys because um little turkey throat, sort of the yeah. last two petals going down. Look at all the variation in colour of this gladiolus. Beautiful pinks into the orange and then the texture, the substance of the flower. Very glittery. Yeah. Um, I don't think a bee can miss this. No. Extremely be. sweet smelling smell. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, in there. oh yes. Uh, they should bottle that definitely. Very oh, sweet. that is very very nice. But the flower doesn't last long, right? No, it doesn't last long at all. And um, it will produce seeds that are very winged. Looks like little wings on them. And the latus means winged. Yeah. And it's because of the seed, the shape of the seed that blows in the wind and finds itself in a little crack in the clay and starts growing again. Okay. Oh, up to the next thing. Let's see what else we need. <laughs> Tough climb. Not just the climb, look at that. Isn't that a miniature world on its own? Well, almost from the Bakwa land. Yeah. But we're right here in the west coast. And looks can be deceiving, right? This could be a very old plant, but it hardly has any soil to grow on, so it's just growing very, very slowly. Very miniaturized because the roots are limited. Yeah, that's quite, that's very beautiful. Deep. So another thing that's fascinating about these rocky outcrops is its miniature gardens of Eden, really. So it really is where you can take inspiration in doing designs, even miniature gardens, bonsai gardens. Now when we do big shows or we do landscape designs, there's always a strict rule that this plant you can't plant with this one because it just doesn't look right. But if you look at this selection we have right here, natural selection, then nothing makes sense. We have an aloe here. We have... Lampranthus friedenbergensis, a fakie only known to grow in these granite outcrops near Friedenberg. And then an orchid. So this is Ceterium odorum. We even have ferns here and Ricinia annuals. Daisies. Yeah, daisies. So uh, look at this combination we have here. If I was to do a show garden abroad, using they would a, deduct. Using a fakie, a aloe, an orchid and a daisy. 
I would deduct a thousand s- points. One square meter, it's really <laughs> an odd combination. But isn't it lovely though? Yeah. So I love I love the orchid. So now this is not the showiest of orchid, but if you look close to it, apparently it smells like cloves at night. This Sitiramadora. It's not quite there yet. I think it will start to smell get the scent a little bit later because see the long spur at the back for a proboscis for a moth right yeah for moth goes in there at night yeah and um yeah so this is all part of this unique landscape in this peaty mix of soil and uh, it's just extraordinary absolutely extraordinary. everyone's fighting to get a piece of this rich um granitic derived soil that has developed over the years yeah each one growing into the other decomposing and regenerating in the same spot for many years. Many, many it creates years. this very curious hotspot of biodiversity, which is a must-see if you're on the west coast here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very nice. So an important part of the west coast is of course water. No, nothing can survive without water. And now after the rains have fallen, it's seeping through the granite cracks underground and it's collecting in these kind of gullies. And in these gullies are some very beautiful plants, especially bulbs, starting to flower now. And this is Romilea soldanensis. Now it's a very rare Romilea and it only grows on this peninsula from Saldana Bay right here to St. Helena Bay. So it's quite a threatened species. And isn't that beautiful? Look at this butter yellow flower with the deep veins inside. And they grow in the water seepage area. So it's absolutely waterlogged, but it's still a sandy base. Now, Romilea is kind of our equivalent of crocus. Doesn't it look like a crocus flower? And even the leaves look like that. Other plants that grow with it in this water seepage spot is the Cochilla say, for instance, here. But isn't that incredible how, with, after this rain, how it's still shooting flowers, but the seed is already starting to fall off and carried by the water to different areas so it can germinate for next season. So the race against time is extreme. So the rush to flower, set seed, and still distribute the seed in this rainy season is from extreme importance. So this is the wetland area, even some fahis in between. So we'll walk up this gully that we have behind me and see what's up there waiting for us. So it's midday now and the flowers have opened from the biggest fahi flower in the world. And this is called Copperbrotus quadrifidus. Now, if I put my hand with it, you can just see how enormous this flower actually is. And it's full of little beetles now pollinating the flower. It's this bright, dark pink fading into white, going to a sunny yellow. <laughs> it's just incredible. Even the leaves are very architectural, and I love that gray tint to it. Now, it's a quite a tough um, ground cover to have in your garden, so you can use this to cover ground where it's really harsh conditions, especially just outside your boundary towards the street. Now you can take cuttings from it and lay it in, it will grow quite quickly. Now they are a rambler or a ground cover, but as you can see here where they're growing naturally, they're actually using the shrubbery in their surrounds to pull them up so that they even become a shrub on their own. So this is really beautiful. If you have a mass of this in your garden or in your rockery, it's really just spectacular. Well, oh, more things. So many things. It's hard to not stop at every point. Ah, oh, that is beautiful. Okay, what do we have here? So here we have a, a symphony of purples and lilacs. Oh, yes. Um, from very common garden plants. So, Nemesia, which one is this? This is Nemesia affinis. Yeah. Um, the bond or Lube. colorful view, Becky. Yeah. And um, the Diascia colina, a very beautiful little annual. Yeah, low growing and spreading from the base. So, you get quite a lot of flowers from it. Um, it flowers now at August, September, dependent on the rain. Very, very important. So sometimes when it's a bit dry, you hardly see any. That is really We've had nice. a good year this year and 
It's so spectacular to see. And you see them, uh, parents, um, these are the parents of many ornamental hybrids in Europe. Yeah, if, uh, if you look at garden centers around the world, really, the Haskers and Amicias are everywhere in six packs, planted as annuals or as instant color pots. And a lot of those parents come from here. Now this is Lacanalia. Which one is this now? Lacanalia metabolis. Metabolis, that's also spectacular. Spectacular color. Can it's see interesting. Some worms have devoured. Oh yeah, this one's completely eaten up. Yeah, but all the colors here is kind of of the same range. Mm, very strange. Yeah, but I see that a lot here on the, on the on the kopi, where you have all the yellows and oranges together, and then you have all of these kind of color ranges together. I'm not sure. There's another worm down there. There's such a ray of insects here, all now eating their heart out. Lachanalia is as well. It's also a very popular garden plant throughout the world as a bulbous um plant for your garden and we have some interesting ones and there's also the blue one that grows on this kopi yes. like a nail of um Peridi flora yeah and that flowers a little bit earlier but that's extremely threatened and uh, very few left of it and they grow right here okay very nice indeed pieces of land there's a lot of bulb erupting so we have more Romilea this is Romilea hirsuta this pink one with a red blotch inside going into a deep deep yellow very beautiful little bulb and then one of the small iris family this is La Perusia Jacquini isn't that just beautiful and look at the markings on the flowers not only the La Perusia but also the Romilea now those markings are like runway lights on flowers. So that attracts the pollinator to come to the flower center and where the pollen is and where the nectar is and where the stamens are to pollinate the flowers. So all of those beautiful markings that you see is there for a reason and they kind of speak words to the insects surrounding this area. Even a beautiful Oxalis here too. All with those distinct beautiful markings leading you right to the center of the flower. So one of the other very colorful um, succulents growing here is our book by Fafis. Now we all know them, we buy them in six packs or in packs of seed to sow for the winter rainfall areas. And they're really spectacular. They give us a show and you get a range of colors these days. This is one of the original species and that's grow here on this kopi as well. Now, but by Fahis, if you look at the plant, you'll see that it shimmers in the sun. It's full of little crystals. And those crystals actually, well, it reflects the sun, first of all, but it absorbs moisture from the mist or the rain, and it swells out. And as it dries out and there's no more rain, it absorbs again the moisture from those nobules or those crystals. So it has a secondary reserve of moisture. Now the flowers, they open up basically only when the sun is shining. Why waste energy for pollinators if there's no sun and it's rainy? Because the pollinators are all hiding um, at night or when it's raining. So this will only use its, air, use its energy to open its flower when the bees are active, like nine to five worker bees, and then close again at night. Now also the seed of the fahis. You'll see there's some fresh seeds, so they're still green. But once they dry out, they are, how can I say, when it rains, the water that falls onto that seed head makes it swell immediately. And then it opens up almost like a starfish. And then those droplets of rain fall onto the seed and it jumps out. So the droplets are the energy, the rain droplets are the energy to take the seed from the seed pod into the soil. And then maybe it will flow down or germinate right here next year. So that's its way. Next season only. So it's going to keep that seed in all the time until the next rain come in next season. 
So very nice, especially a nice garden plant for next season's flower show in your garden. So one of the herbal plants that's growing here is this. And I think it's got a lot of potential. This is called Belota Africana. Now, we only have one Belota growing here. The rest is from the Mediterranean. Belota is part of the mint family. Its common name is Catacrate. Why? Because it looks like Napita. Napita is catnip. It does look like it. And I think this plant, well, it looks like Flomas or even some of the mints, has great potential for a cottage garden or a perennial garden. So we need some growers to start growing Belota a lot more because I want it for my gardens. Now it's in flower right now. And as you can see, it's got that typical Flomas or Napita structure to it. And the little almost salvia-like flowers popping through. And we saw some hoverflies that's pollinating them and drinking the nectar from them. It's a really nice plant. As you can see, it's very neat. And the traditional um, people from the past use this for all kinds of ailments. Uh, uh, quite a lot, actually. So this is a widespread plant. grows all the way along the West Coast. Uh, but I do think we need to keep this in, in our minds when we do some indigenous gardens. There are also a lot of pelargoniums that grow on these rocky outcrops. And quite a few of them are in flower at the moment, and I'll show you a couple more. But this is probably my favorite. Well, okay. I've got lots of favorites, but this is one of them. This is called the vine leaf pelagonium, Pelagonium lobatum. And if you look at the leaves, first of all, and this is a small example, they get huge. You can see at the leaves, and it's being munched by a beautiful caterpillar. It looks like a vine leaf. And the flowers is what makes it so spectacular. Now you don't see a lot of pelagonias with kind of a yellowy, greeny tint to the flower, but this one has it. If you do a close-up, you see all those beautiful markings in too. So it's got this yellowy, greeny color, almost blends in with the surroundings here at the background with those gorgeous, dark, maroony markings in it. And it flowers quite a lot. There's a lot of flower stalks shooting out. Now it's geophytic, so it means it's got like a tuba underground that stores all its energy in there. And then once the rainy season comes, it shoots out and makes these huge big leaves and then start to flower. It's not a very common pelargonium because it's difficult to spot here in between the shrubbery. But once you've noticed it, oh, I can't take my eyes off it. So very nice. Now I'm gonna to go to another pelargonium now, which has taken the horticultural world by storm. So one of the other pelargoniums that's in full flower here on the mountain outcrops is this. This is Pelargonium fulgidum, or the Roymalfa. Now this is where the red pigment came from, for all those hybridized pelargoniums that you see in Europe, on the windowsills, and indeed here in our garden centers. So fulgidum is kind of the opposite when it comes to lobatum that we just spoke about, because lobatum wants the moths at night to pollinate the flower. This one is attracting daytime visitors, especially the sunbird. And that is why it's that red color. And the flower is the exact shape for the sunbird to enter and drink some nectar. Now for them, the leaves are hairy and lobed. Why is the hair so prominent? It's because of the mist. So the mist tend to condense on these hairy bits on the leaves and on the stalks. And that drips down, down the plant, all the way to the root base. And so it absorbs the moisture that it can get. Now, any moisture it can get is very valuable. So it will try its utmost best to harvest as much as it can. So even the leaves, when I smell it, this has got a very strong scent to it. I'm not sure how to place it, but it's, it's kind of spicy. Whereas Lobatin didn't really have a scent to it. It does go down in summer because it's very dry and hot here. But in winter, as soon as the rain starts falling, the trunks start to swell out again and then the new growth shoot out. This is a very, very spectacular and a beautiful pelargonium that we have here. And it's especially abundant in the mountain well, ranges here in Britannia Bay and St. Helena Bay. So whenever you drive here, this is one to come and see, definitely. We 
you go out flower hunting this season, there are lots of flowers to see. Drive out early from Cape Town all the way up to the West Coast, but don't be discouraged if you don't see a lot of flowers yet. In the afternoon when you go back, that's when you're going to see them. So early morning, drive out, get to where you want to go, what reserve it is, go enjoy the reserve and the flowers. And then when you drive back to Cape Town, that's when all of the flowers will face you. Remember, the flowers follow the sun, so in the morning they um, showing this way to the east where the sun is coming up. But they only open late, half past 10 probably most of the daisies. And if it's cloudy, not at all. Uh, so you are already at the reserve and the flowers are open, you're enjoying the day. But when you go back and drive that highway back to um, Cape Town, that's when you're going to see all the flowers looking right at you and a lot of selfie potential. I hope you guys enjoyed our virtual hike today, hopping between the granite boulders outside St. Helena and Britannia Bay. This is a very special part of the West Coast. It's a very unique part of the West Coast. Up here there are plants that grow nowhere else on the planet. Up here there are plants that have been discovered that's contributed immensely to the world horticultural industry. This is a very unique plant that has diversity that rivals most. But for all special areas like this one, threat is around the corner. Not only from farming, but also from human development. This is the elevated par right next to the beach. Up here, beach houses are prime property to have a view to see the dolphins play in the ocean. The plants that grow here can grow nowhere else. They're adapted to this environment, these situations. But I guess beach houses are important. So it's with a sad heart that I leave this space and I know that this won't be here much longer.